He was born, but he was born so that he could die. So that we walk in his resurrection power. Wow. Well, we celebrate today that he rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. The question, though, to consider today is, is our life a womb or is it a tomb? Does, his, does your life birth more of Jesus in and around you, or is it dead, not really making a difference, just kind of sliding through life, seemingly making no headway? Let's live. There's excitement in that living. If you've studied the Bible for any length of time, you know that Jesus was born a virgin birth, a perfect, sinless virgin birth. He lived 33 years a sinless life to take all the sins of humanity, so mine and yours and the whole world's, on his shoulders and die to be that bridge from heaven to us because he knew we couldn't do it on our own. In Old Testament times, there were certain rituals and sacrifices for the atoning of mankind's sin because we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. And so there were those there were actually five different kinds of sacrifices that they did, different kinds of offerings. Burnt offerings, grain offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, and trespass offerings. Like, they had rules and rituals that were for each of those. Big time. You think, we, you know, we don't have to do all those things now. <laughs> but that's what they had to do. When Jesus died on the cross, though, the veil was torn. Remember that? The veil was torn so that we now no longer have to go to the high priest. Jesus is that intermediary. And we can go right to Jesus. We don't have to remember the rituals or, oh, I messed up. Now I got to go to the temple and I got to do this, 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 and I got to take that. And, you know, <laughs> he is our high priest. Death and hell thought they won that day when Jesus died. But with all power and might, Jesus resurrected on the third day. And thus, we celebrate today, Resurrection Sunday. There are times that it seems that all has been lost. Can you think of that in your own life? Seems like all has been lost. But Jesus shows up in his resurrection power. We all want more resurrection power, don't we? We, we love that idea. He rose from the dead. Yeah, he lives in us. We can do this thing. We want that. But are we willing to count the cost to walk in that resurrection power. In a moment, we're going to dive in, and so you may want to flip to, because our main text today is Philippians 3.10. But now we're going to talk about the dunamis power in that verse, the resurrection power. That's dunamis in the Greek. It means excellence of soul, mind, will, and emotions, and the and then also the force of heaven's army's capacity to do miracles. So excellence of soul, like, like it's, it's subjected unto him. But then also the capacity to walk out and do miracles. Who doesn't want that? You see a need, you want to be able to, <laughs> you know, change the world. But it starts in us. The excellence of soul starts in us. That's some work to do. There's deliverance. We can't stop there. There's inner healing, can't stop there. There's equipping and discipleship. You need, you need it all. And then you'll know him. And you'll walk with him. And you'll change the world. Jesus' resurrection power allows us to walk in excellence of soul. It's not just for the next guy. It's for you. We can be whole, but it takes us yielding. In Exodus 28, 33 through 35, you don't have to flip there, but I'll just remind you, um, Aaron was the priest, and they, they said, this is the stuff that priests wear. This is what Aaron's going to wear. Okay? And so the one part of his clothing he wore was a turban, and they talked about wrapping his head in a turban, and it said, holy is the Lord. Well, he was a priest. 
and he put on, right, because he wrapped himself in a turban, he put on the mind of Christ. Holy is the Lord. Now let's fast forward. We live in New Testament times, don't we? First Peter, um, I don't have it right before me. Yes, I do. First Peter 2, 5 and 9, talk about that we're a royal priesthood, a chosen people. Guess what? It's not just for the priests anymore. It's for every one of us who call ourselves sons and daughters. Now we're the royal priesthood. And so we get to put that turban on our heads. Holy is the Lord. We get to have the minds of Christ. We get to have excellence of soul. But we have to know that to walk in that. Holy is the Lord. Our minds, wills, and emotions can be sanctified. It's not some far out idea. We don't have to settle for our feelings all over the place. We don't have to settle for our emotions out of order. Frazzled minds, destructed bodies. We don't have to settle for that. Jesus has the power to heal all those things. When he went to the cross and he rose from the grave, he offered that to us, his royal priesthood. We can do this. Then the forces of heaven's armies to do miracles is another piece of that dunamis power. According to Ephesians 2, 6, we are seated with him in heavenly places, looking down at what's going on and actually knowing how to address it. Not going, I don't know what to do. This is too much. Help. No, it's looking down. We're seated with him. We reign with him. We get to, t- we get to speak the things into being that which need to be. That is the power of the resurrection in us. But what coincides with resurrection power? Remember I said, we all want that resurrection power because who wouldn't? We'd be silly not to. But there's another piece of that. Philippians 3, 10, to know him and the power of the resurrection of him and the fellowship of suffering of him being conformed to the death of him. To know him in the powers of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering conforms us into his likeness. Suffering with knowing Jesus in his resurrection, that's what coincides with the resurrection power. The fellowship of his sufferings. Let's break that down. In the Greek, the word for suffering is pathima. It means affliction, Passions, emotions, enduring property, property, the capacity and privilege to experience strong feelings, agony undergone on behalf of the same cause for which Christ patiently endured. The love we have known in the Western world is not love. His love conforms us to his likeness. It's not just a feeling. It's not just a like. It's not just a, oh, I'm, I'm good with this. No, it conforms us to his likeness. What does he love? What is he passionate about? Will we accept his love? Let's break it down. For the sake of Jesus, have you or are you experiencing pain? Being afflicted with something? Feeling what someone else is feeling? Having the answers? because he gives them to you, and then walking it out no matter the cost, even if you're all alone. Feeling what what Jesus would deeply for a situation. I mean, tears, travail, heartache, heaviness. Waking in the night. Travailing during the day. Looking ridiculous at times. Needing to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because the pain is so great. In your flesh, you could trigger easily. Oh, it's overwhelming, right? But the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings cause you to be conformed to his likeness because you know the mission and you go after it no matter what. That's suffering. That's suffering, and that's worth it. 
We don't get the power of the resurrection minus these other things. Like, we, it's plus. Power of the resurrection plus the suffering that we fellowship with him in conforms us to his likeness. In the Greek, the word for fellowship is koinonia. You may have heard that before. It's to commune with, have the same mind as Christ. WWJD, remember those bracelets from years ago? Some people maybe had shirts, right? What would Jesus do? Like communing with him. Doesn't mean it's comfortable. But when we, when we have excellence of soul, when we go after that, when we, are, when we fellowship with him in his sufferings, we are conformed to his likeness. How do we partner with him? That's another way we look at suffering. How do we partner with him? It doesn't mean you feel like it all the time. It's okay. It's okay if you don't feel like it. It's an opportunity to crucify the flesh. So it's he, not me. Do as he says, not as we feel. We teach our kids that. Let's walk in it. First, first John 1, 3, and 6. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. See, we can't have fellowship with darkness in fellowship with light. It just doesn't work. It's black or white. We commune with him. Think intimately about sharing a meal and a conversation together. We can't do anything with darkness or actually we lose step with the Lord. Can't hear him as well. All of a sudden he's like a distant voice that you don't even remember what he looks like. How he acts. Because we fellowship with darkness and we don't need that. We lose our connection when we do that. We need to connect with Jesus as the Messiah, the one who's the Savior of the world, and that includes suffering. It's not about our comfort. I've said it before, but God is confronting the idol of personal comfort in Western civilization. He's tearing it down. Do you feel it? Like, there's a consecration happening. It's painful. Fellowship with him in his suffering, it's going to be worth it because we'll be conformed to his likeness. We'll walk in his resurrection power. Hello, that's awesome stuff. Why wouldn't we want that? Lives will be changed for eternity. To know him in the power of his resurrection and all that entails, excellence of soul, being well, and the capacity to do miracles, see someone that has a need and you know how to fix it. With the power of Jesus. <laughs> that changes the world. And in his suffering, what he's passionate about, no matter the cost, whether it's physical, spiritual, mental, relational, financial, whatever it is. Yes, Lord, I yield. It's not a question. It's not a logically, I'm going to, I need to see all this first. No, it's a, I yield. I trust you. You took care of it on the cross. You did this on the cross. Now, my Life is to live for you, so I yield. I don't have to understand it. That can cause, causes us to be conformed to his death in his likeness. The conforming in scripture means embody. Embody it. Like it, it's, not, it's not that you can have a three-point message regarding it. It's like it becomes you. It is you. So you walk it out. There's no separating what you know and who you are. It just is. That's the con conforming. It's embodying him. We want to be found in him. We want nothing less. We want that complete surrender, that complete yielding. Then we become like him, but it's a daily dying process. The power of the cross. Wow. He didn't just stay in the grave, though. 
and it was confusing. He died. What in the world? <laughs> Where's the Messiah? I thought this and I thought that and I don't understand and all hope seemed lost. But then on the third day, Jesus rose. On the third day, Jesus rose. How many of us have, are in this place of a second day life and we're going, <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get what's going on. And we take it back. Take back what we said. He is it. It's finished. He's good. But I don't understand, you know, so I don't understand. And, and it, it, God doesn't fit into the, the ways of thinking in a box. No, he doesn't. He's out of the grave. A stone rolled away. Cloths all over. He's alive. He talks with us and he walks with us. But that second day, some of us are stuck there. We're going, I don't get it. Because we want logic. We want him in a box. But you know, and, and we don't even realize it. But you know where it comes from? A hardness of heart. Something hurt us. We haven't reconciled with it maybe. There's pain that we might not have the words for, so we don't even know how to process it. And we get hard. And instead of taking it to the Lord and just being real, we put up fences, we put up walls, and we call it the American way. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's not the power of the resurrection. That's not fellowshipping in his sufferings. He just says, come to me as you are. But he doesn't say, stay there. Remember, he, he went in that tomb. He didn't stay there. It didn't make sense to a watching world. But he is who he says he is. And so on that second day, don't give up hope. Be real. You'll find people that are in that second day mentality often. You walk in the resurrection power. And if you fellowship in his sufferings, you'll be conformed to his likeness, and then you'll be the miracle that God uses in their lives. Are you willing? Let's look at that hardness of heart piece, though. In John 14, 30, it says, I'll not talk to you much more. That's Jesus. For the ruler of this world is coming and he has no claim on me. And if we look at the Greek, it's kind of like no hook in me. I keep saying this, like you don't want a fish hook in your foot. It's kind of hard to walk. If we have any hooks in us, we don't actually take ground. We don't actually walk in that resurrec resurrection power. If we say, you know, I'm not going to really fellowship in, with him and his sufferings. I'm going to just make sense of things. And it, it doesn't make, this part that he's revealing to me doesn't really make sense. And this person irritates me because actually they're the messenger that the Lord is sending a new message to you regarding. It still lines up with his word, but there's a message and you're like, I don't really get it. So that person irritates me. No, no hook in me, Lord. No hook in me. I want no hook. I want no claim of the enemy on my life. I confess that lie I believed. I repent thinking like that. He judges the thoughts, motives, and intentions of our hearts. It's not just what we do. It's not what's just seen. He's judging it all. So confess it because you know what? He sees it anyway, so don't hide. No reason to hide. He so desperately says, I want you to be conformed to my likeness. I want to use you. But he can't use us if we're not willing. Hardness of heart. So there are, there are reasons we look at that accuse, divide, 
pit against, that's the enemy. Every time, right? Jesus doesn't accuse. Now he does divide, he separates, but not in a way anything other than to breathe life. Mark 3, if you turn there, you know, I was just looking at this recently about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Whew. So the religious leaders were in the synagogue. They, nor- they noticed Jesus was in that synagogue too. They noticed that there was a man with a deformed hand. And since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. They were watching. Are, is he going to follow the rules? If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus was so smart, though. And he, you know what? We have that resurrection power. Guess what? We get to have that mind of Christ, too. We actually know how to address these things, then. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? He just asked the hard question. Like, let's just bring up what's actually really going on here. Let's get beyond the fact that you don't want this man's hand to be healed because it breaks the law. Wait a minute, is it about doing good? Isn't that the bigger picture? We can get so zeroed in on the speck on the floor that needs to be vacuumed up that we actually miss what God is doing. Oh, I don't like the seats. I don't like the music. I don't like how that person talks. And we miss what God is actually doing because we put him in a box. Well, so Jesus said, you know, is it about evil or or about doing good? And is this a day to save a life or destroy it? He just gets right to it. But they wouldn't answer him. <laughs> they, they knew, like, they, they didn't have a good answer. But he went on and he actually healed the man. Because he did, he, even if it's like, you know, this takes me to the cross even sooner. Not my will, but yours be done, yours be done Lord. I'll do whatever it takes. Is that you? I'll do whatever it takes. Or is there a hardness of heart that wants to pit? We each need to ask this of ourselves. And then Ephesians 4.18. Their minds are full of darkness. They wandered far from the life God gives because they were closed They had closed minds and hardened their hearts against him. If you went on, it even says they had no sense of shame. They lived for lustful pleasure and eagerly practiced every kind of impurity. That hardness of heart can lead us to do whatever we want in the moment because it feels good. But if we know him in his resurrection, and fellowship with him in his suffering will be conformed to his likeness. That's a great place to be. That is where the hope lies. It's where the hope lies. And then Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not copy, or some versions say, do not conform to the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Not just the way you act, right? Because our thoughts actually precede our actions. Then we'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. There'll be a conforming to his likeness. Let's get to our behaviors and our customs and our ways of doing things. It's an examining season like nothing I've ever seen in my lifetime. Tear off every cloth you've had over something to hide the imperfections. 
every layer, every band-aid. Allow him to do the work. Because we know his power is made perfect in our weakness. We can trust that. But we have to be real. And out of that real will come beauty. One last verse, James 1, 22 through 25-ish, talks about being doers of the word, not just hearers. For so long, the church has sat in pews and listened and said, yep, I agree, that's good. And they walk out the doors and they do whatever they do and they come back for refilling or so to say, but it's really just inspiration without transformation. <laughs> We're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then we'll test and approve and know the perfect will of God. I'm going to pray. Father in heaven, <laughs> you are you sent your son, Jesus, the perfect spotless lamb, to be slain. So we don't go and perform all these special rituals and sacrifices any longer to make up for our messes. Thank you for that, Jesus. You bore it all for us. But you say not to just stay in that. Like, yes, we're to know the power of your resurrection. But to actually walk that out means we know your heart. And we're actually doers of your heart. We're conformed. And if I think of forming in a, in a jello mold, the old that my aunts used to make jello in a jello mold for holidays and put all kinds of things in it. <laughs> and that jello would set. It was liquid. And it turned into a formation in that old Tupperware jello mold. <laughs> but Lord, you're conforming us to your likeness if we're willing to be put in that. Not because you want us to fit in a box, but because so that we're actually usable for you. And some of us might be the carrots. Ooh, in that jello. Some of us might be the, the squishy raspberry flavor. Some of us might be the marshmallows. How do those go together? I don't know, but I'm thankful that you know. My aunts used to put all kinds of things together like that. But you know, when, when, when we're put in this jello salad, that, again, doesn't even make sense. I'm, I'm just, like, I'm laughing at your vision in my head, Lord, right now. That Because cause how crazy, like, why are we talking jello salad? I think a salad is something healthy, but there was really nothing healthy about that jello salad. <laughs> but <laughs> it was good. <laughs> it was good. But you, you're so awesome, God, because you use each of us. And you conform us. Like, if we, we're, we're willing to be conformed. We actually taste good, like Marlene just declared. We actually taste good to the world so that they have what they need and their bellies are full. Lord, thank you even for humor of a jello salad that you just brought to mind. You are never dull. And so may I, we recognize that and say, yes, Lord, I'm yielded. We love you, Father God. We declare, do what you must in us so that we walk in your likeness. We have your hearts and your minds. That's the power of the cross. That's the power that you took when you rose from the grave and you had conquered death and hell. Like, we don't have to do this alone. And it's not dull. It's not boring. It's not day-by-day -day drudgery. It's awesome. And so we praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we take hold of that now. And we will be doers of the word. In Jesus' name and all for your glory. Amen. Bless you.
Have an amazing day celebrating however you celebrate with those that you're with. Share reservoir power. And enough to just talk about it. Do it. Bless you.